So we're going to be focusing today on the England years. 1970 was a pivotal year for Alan Hudson. You'd, the 69-70 season, you'd, you'd just broken into the team. Chelsea had got to the FA Cup final. All was looking great. And then on Easter Monday, you had an injury at the Hawthorns that put paid to your Wembley appearance and also prevented you from being the first teenager to represent England at the World Cup finals. Yeah, yeah. Well, uh, at that time, um, it never entered my mind, of course. Mm. You don't think about things like that. But uh, I think there was so much going on at that it, in such a short space of time at, at, at that time. I'd only been in the Chelsea team for six months, say. Um, and I was just finding my feet in that team. And the closer we got to Wembley for the FA Cup, uh, little did I know, you know, it wasn't until we played QPR uh, in the sixth round, I think, and we we beat them and Venables played and Marsh played and uh, they had a half a decent team. It was a big local derby. And uh, we knocked them out. And that was when Alf Ramsey came out with a... Osgood scored a hat-trick, which really clinched his place in in the in the Mexico uh, squad. And then Alf came out with that saying that there's, there's no limit to what I could achieve. And, you know, that gave me... I think that put me in the firing line for Mexico myself. Because you were in that original 40. You would have gone and many years later one of your journalist friends said that when Bobby Charlton did come off in that game it would have been you not Colin Bell that replaced him because you were really primed because Bobby was getting a little bit older and it was you that was primed to take over from Bobby Charlton in that England shirt wasn't it? Well I, I think um, Alf would have looked at it in a way that it was I was young fit I had I not had obviously not had the injury at West Brom I'd, I'd, I'd have still been very fit. I was getting stronger. I was the, the 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 longer the more games I played, the better I was playing. Um, and I think he probably see me as having the young legs and uh, and uh, having the, uh, being clever enough to to play in that role and just say to me, you know, you make sh- you know I couldn't do what Bobby Charlton could do as as regards going forwards and shooting and things like that. But he wouldn't have wanted me to do that. It would just have been a matter of going and sitting in there with Alan Ball and trying to keep the ball with 2 0 up and stopping Beckenbauer from doing what he actually did in the end, and that was to crucify us. Yeah, again, many people say that they took off Bobby to rest him for the semi finals, but when you look at it and you, you hear and you read press cuttings, it wasn't that. Bobby was tiring and, and, and Alf just wanted to freshen it up, didn't he? Well, he did. I, I think. I think that is a question that would mm. never be answered. Yeah. Um, only Alf would ever. You know, he took that to his grave with him. Whatever he was thinking, uh, I, I think it was bad management um, myself. Because if you're two 0 up in any game and you're and you're controlling the game, which we were, I think we we were actually playing better in seventy than what we did in sixty six. We. Um, and we proved that against Brazil as well in the, you know, in that match. Um, but we 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 were controlling the Germans. We had everything under control. And there's one thing you don't do is when you're controlling the game, is change things. Yeah. Uh, and that wouldn't that would have meant even if I would have been on the line, he brought me on it. It would have been a wrong decision. I'd have just kept Bobby on there because even the, it, it kind of even the Germans admitted that they couldn't believe that he brought Charlton off because as as they said in the 66 final they, Bobby and Beckenbauer cancelled themselves out of the game and, and they did the same in 70 and it was just so happens that we you know we we mastered them really we, it was the best we have, we have played in them two World Cups I think uh, apart from the Brazil game which I think we were outstanding I think it was probably Bobby Moore's greatest game ever, but no, I, I think I think Alf, Alf made a, a massive mistake changing the team at that stage. And again, 
what confidence it does give the Germans when, when you do see your opposition's best player going off. It almost gives them a little bit of an, an adrenaline boost, doesn't it? And I hear what you're saying. It's almost like when you're picking your team, if your best players aren't playing, then your opposition looks around and thinks, happy days here, we've got half a chance. Whereas if your big players are on the pitch, it, it's psychologically game on, isn't it? Well, yeah, I think if you look at if if you, if you, if you look at boot on the other foot, um, the Germans were two 0 up, and they took Beckenbauer off, and uh, and say Muller or Seeler off, uh, we'd have felt more comfortable defensively, and we'd have we'd have thought we can go on, and and and, and we got half a chance here. Whereas if they just keep them on the field, I remember I remember years and years. ago, uh, well, not that too long after. I played in a game at Chelsea and uh, we played at Stoke in the League Cup. Um, it was a Wednesday night and Osgood had a fight, you know, a, a big bust up with Sexton in the dressing room at half time and he pulled him off. And uh, Stoke were 1 0 up at the time and we come out at half time and you could see Stoke looking round at each other, wondering where Osgood was and they knew that. You know, they have one less problem, and Aussie, Aussie was our, you know, a, he was our main man. He was our, he was our goal machine, and by Sexton pulling him off, he, you know, he, put, he, he gave Stoke, as you just said, so much more yeah. confidence to go on and win the game. Now, your your international career consisted of of two games, unbelievably two games. We're going to get on to that. But your under twenty three career, that was uh, you played nine games, didn't you, for the under twenty threes? Talk me through your I, first uh, game. I, I have no idea. <laughs> I haven't got a clue. I know. I, I know my first game got. Yeah. To, uh, my first game was uh, at my other worst ground, which was Roker Park. Yeah. It was the only where that was the only time I ever got sent off in one of my last games for Stoke. But. Um, uh, yeah, that got post. That got postponed. That got abandoned through snow. Uh, I don't know of how long to go, but uh, it wasn't a much of a game because of the snow itself. It's part of the game. Uh, I remember that being my first game. Uh, I remember a game at Hamden Park, which was with, with about twenty twenty odd thousand, and it sounded like there was about two hundred thousand in there. It was amazing. Uh, I didn't really play that well. Um, and I remember a couple of games against Wales. One when I came back from a, a bad injury and and, and had an a, a outstanding game down in Wrexham. And uh, that was a game when Alf said to me uh, after the match, I think you better preserve yourself. You know, you're doing a little bit too much hard work, which I found a little bit... Uh, <laughs> I couldn't believe his words actually yeah. you know I can understand him saying about players not working hard enough but I don't think a player can work too hard uh, but I was just uh, I used that match as uh, a kind of a comeback and uh, as a fitness test for me really and uh, and, I, and I had a really good game on, on a really heavy pitch which uh, I used to like playing on heavy pitches uh, because of my, my bad ankle Now your three-year ban, that was towards the end of, was it the 71-72 season? You were, you were still at Chelsea, obviously. Yeah. Um, yeah. And it, it must have been before the 1972 game against Northern Ireland. So can you throw a little bit more light on that? Because Bobby Moore had told you that, that you were going to make your international, your full international debut for England against Northern Ireland, a game that your um, your old adversary Terry Neal scored the uh, the winning well, that goal. Was that, that, yeah, that, that was my first. That was my. Yeah. I think that was my first full international squad. Yeah. Uh, and um, and Bobby just took me under his wing, and uh, Bobby, I don't know what it, what it was. Uh, He's, I think he might have seen a little bit of uh, George in me, uh, and I don't know. He, he just took a liking to me, and he, as a kid, and he took me under his wing, and and he came up to me before training. And he just put his arm around me, and we was walking across, and you know I felt quite privileged. And and all of a sudden he said, "Well done." He said, "You're playing tonight," and uh, and Bobby himself wasn't playing, funnily enough, and. 
and he said congratulations thank you just come you know and he gave me a bit of advice about you know how to play you know just how, just play as you do at your club level blah 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 and uh and then all of a sudden we had a little bit of a warm up and then Alf called us in and then he read the team out and my name wasn't mentioned and I looked at Bobby and he looked at me and he was so embarrassed and he, he apologised to me after and I, I, I said, Bobby, don't, please don't apologise to me. I said, you was trying to help me and he, 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 he must have changed his mind as he was looking around at the squad. I don't know, right? I don't know what happened but why tell Bobby in the first place that I, I was yes. going to play? I don't know. Is, is another one of our mysteries, you know. Did your band come after that episode out or before yes. it? Yeah, it did. Yes, okay, it so did. that there was all these little things that, that were leading up to. And obviously, as you would alluded to earlier, the heavier pitches suited you because of that injury that you picked up at the Hawthorns. And, and injuries yes. dogged your career. And, I mean, even so... Many years later, in 1975, Tony Waddington got the fire brigade out so you could play again on an Easter Monday because you needed those heavy pitches. That's where you thrived. Well, yeah, I mean, I, I had a chronic... Uh, people don't really know, not, not even the doctors knew at that time. And I was going outside the club and seeing... I went to see so many different doctors and uh faith healers and this that and the other trying to find out you know uh i even went to see a fella called um uh, tucker uh, and he was he, he used to look after all the big boxers and uh, through the fella called tony mancini who was uh, a boxing family he he put my father onto him and we went to see him and fun and strangely enough i went to bermuda some years later and uh, he was a part of uh, there's a place in bermuda called tucker town and he was one of that family uh, um but he would he was a top man in his field and uh, not 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 even he could do anything with this uh injury of mine uh i'm mean, I, 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 I could i could write an old we could do an old program on yeah. the people i see and uh, how many different kind of um, treatments I had on it. But it, it was never going to get better. Um, and therefore, I, I, it, it made it near impossible for me to, to play on hard grounds or, or anything like that. I, I just just needed the rain. Uh, and, I just, and the greatest thing that ever happened was... Probably my two most famous games were on the heaviest pitches. One was when it rained for two days before the West Germany game and, and the other is when, as you say, Tony got the fire brigade out before the Liverpool game, when it, which was a, a big match over Easter. It was a third of third of uh, three matches over them four days we used to play in. Friday, we played Friday and uh, Saturday in London, West Ham and Arsenal. And then we went back to play the, the Liverpool, the European champions at that time. And I I was absolutely gutted. I said to the Tony, I said, Governor, I said, uh, I think I'll, I'll be missing Monday. You know, it was top of the table clash as well. And, and he just said to me, no, you won't. He said, you won't. He said, because I've heard the weather forecast. He said, he said I've heard it's going to rain. And he made it all up, uh, knowing in his mind that he would get the fire brigade in, which was a master, another master stroke by him. But again, that's what it's all about: man, managing the person, managing the player, and managing the injury. And that's something that Ramsey didn't do because he phoned you up at Stamford Bridge, and he pretty much ordered you to to go to that um, under twenty three tournament whilst you were nursing an injury and because you didn't he then banned you and Colin Todd um, Malcolm yeah, McDonald I... come with the old back injury and he got away with it but you know he got, Malcolm, Malcolm was the smartest one of the three of us yeah. because, because he knew they couldn't detect a back, in, back injury uh, but that's what happens when you're honest you see if you're honest you get no you get nowhere in the game and all, all yeah. I don't Dan was being completely honest with him. But it was just the way he done it. Um, I think it, it, football's no different from any other walk of life. Um, I was just told to be at Stanford Bridge at one day about two o'clock to expect a call from Ramsey. He was calling me from about a mile away. 
uh, when he could have he could have asked to meet me somewhere and sat down and had a cup of tea with me or a cup of coffee or something or even a glass of wine and said, what's your problem? Yep. And we could have talked it through. I mean, that's what Waddington would have done. He would have said, he would have called me in his office or he would have took me out to lunch and said, what's, you know, what, what's the problem if I, or my form was out? He, he would have asked, you know, communication is everything. And, and Alf was just so... You know, he was like a school teacher talking to a, a child, really. And it was, uh, if you're not, if you're not Heathrow there tomorrow, you'll just take. I'll never forget the words. If you're not Heathrow tomorrow, you'll just take the consequences. And and I can remember uh, coming off the phone to him. I can remember walking back down to Christine Matthews' office um, uh, in the Chelsea office itself. It, it was pretty. Uh, I mean, it, it, it was like look, walking through death row, really. Yeah. Uh, and it didn't really hit me until I got to her. And she said, what What did he say? I, I said, uh, he hasn't really told me anything. He just said, I've got to take the consequences. And, and Christine being her, she said, well, you are a silly boy. You should go. I said, look, Christine, you don't understand. Mm. You know, nobody understands. You get an injury like this, you just, you just don't go and play them. For, for anybody with a, a bad injury and I need the rest and I did need the rest we had had a long hard season and uh, I was thinking of uh, trying to rest it and, and thinking about the following season and the England under 23s at that time was the, the father thing if it had been a full international I just wouldn't have been out of play so yeah. You know, I, you know, it, it was just the way he treated me. He treated me like I was a kid, and um, you know, there he was a few, just three months earlier, saying there's no no limit to what he can achieve. And if you looked at any other country in the world, it, it would have been like, if I'm 18, 19, it would have been like Holland, you know, kicking Cruyff out. For f banning him for three years or in Argentina as a kid uh, Messi or Maradona you say you're banned for three years Colin Todd was that probably our best young defender the replacement of Bobby Moore at that time it, it was a you know the perfect replacement and and there he is banning our best young defender as yeah. well so and then they wondered why we didn't qualify for the World Cup for the next 10 years or 12 years and it was that's where it all began. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not saying it was us too, but you do not ban your, your best young players. I mean, I mean, look at what's happened since in the World Cup. We're, we're crying out for young players to come through and break through and, and, cut, and you encourage these young players to come through. You don't treat them like they're, you know, uh, juvenile delinquents yeah. or they're doing something really wrong. I did absolutely nothing wrong, and and uh, looking back just four or five years ago, and I'm thinking how the game has changed. You got Rio Ferdinand failing a drugs test, and or not not taking his drug test, and he gets nine months. And yeah. I thought, Christ, what's going on here? You know, it, only because it was Ferguson who, who you know behind it all. Mm. Um, and I thought, you know, it, it was just at Ramsey. I think because he won the World Cup, he kind of put himself up on a pedestal to, 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 to actually do what anything he wanted to do, and it was wrong. There should have been, I should have been brought in front of a, a, a committee of some sort and asked questions of why I didn't want to go on this tour, which, yeah. was, which was a friendly tour. It wasn't even, a, you know, a, like they do today, a, a World Cup under 21 World Cup. It was just a friendly uh, under twenty three tour, and you know my ankle just wouldn't have took it. We're just interrupting you a little bit here. Uh, Gary Tibble says, "Great to hear Alan Hudson." He also said, "Alan should have played more for England." I think everybody agrees with that. And Mossy says, "Hi, yeah, uh, hi guys." Um, great listening to Alan Hudson as always. Now, Bobby Moore. Let's talk briefly about Bobby. Um, my my opinion is with with great captains. It, they they almost win your things rather than, than than the managers because they're the ones on the pitch and the the way I looked at 1966 had Bobby Moore not applied for England we, we probably wouldn't have won it we, we did have yes some world class players and then when Alf's 
time is is running out, I think the ideal, looking back, and it's great to have a crystal ball, but I think having Bobby Moore managing the England team and have, or having some input in the England team would have been instrumental to the development of the younger, more maverick players that the establishment overlooked for a generation almost. No, I couldn't agree more. I, I think um, as young players, you know, young players look up to yeah. uh, people like Bobby. It, it was uh, Bobby, but but Bobby was more than just a great player. You know, the likes of Bobby Charlton. You know, you you can't say the same thing of because Bobby was a different character at all. But, but Bobby Moore was like more like a Franz Beckenbauer in Germany. You know the way. He, he, you know, he handled himself. Um, he took over the team there. Uh, Johan Cruyff in, you know, taking over the Dutch team. I'm not saying Bobby Moore would have been a great England manager, yeah. but, you know, make, you know, put him some kind of position and, and bring... I think he would have been a great England manager if, you know, with someone like Don Howe as a coach under him. Yeah. Bobby would have, Bobby knew the best players in the country and Don would have, you know, straightened them out, you know, uh, you know, I'm not a lover of coaches, but Don is the only one I can actually say I've ever played under that, um, that did anything you know wor worthwhile in training. Uh, but he never told you what to do. He just organised your defence. And uh, I, 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 yes, I agree. I mean, and nobody's ever mentioned that Bobby Moore. I mean, the way Bobby was treated by the FA was shabby anyway. Uh, it was terrible, and, uh, and I think the same goes for West Ham. The way they treated him uh, was awful. To let him to let him leave and go to Fulham like he did uh, after giving such service to them. I mean, they got to three finals in three. He he he. he I think he's probably the only man who got the three finals in three years um, by winning the, the the FA Cup with West Ham. Then they won the Cup Winners Cup the year after with West Ham at Wembley, and then. The following year, I think they won the World Cup. Yep. So he's gone up them steps three times in three years, and now, now you can't get no greater experience than that. And 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 doing it for West Ham as well. He's and West Ham treated him as if he was just another player at the end of the day. And then you got the likes of Trevor Brooking, who, who gets a job with the FA. Yep. Now that doesn't, to me, that doesn't add up. But as a person as well. What was Bobby like? Because, you know, it, it set you guys under the wings and, and not only, you know, on the training field, but but down to the pubs. And, and Bobby was part of the scene, wasn't he? You know, he well, was... you go to, for, if, you, if, you, if you can imagine knowing Bobby and he's won the World Cup, he's done everything in the game there is to be done. Yeah. Um, he's revered by everyone. And if he walked in the pub and you're in the pub, he, you know, he was, he was just another one of the lads. He was, but he was always immaculate. He was always immaculately dressed, uh, and he was always one of the lads. He was never, never put himself above anybody. He was modest as anything, and and he, he was always there for advice for for anyone. And 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 for me, he was terrific, uh, right to the end. You know, even before he died, when I, the last time I see him. Was at a Phil Collins concert, and me and Phil had a drink together. And... Just couldn't take his eyes off him. It was like he was talking. He was talking to some, you know, some kind of god. Uh, but he was just the most wonderful, wonderful man. You know, uh, you know, my man was Waddington, but he was a manager. Uh, but he was the most wonderful man as a as a footballer that I ever met. You were having the time of your life at Stoke. You were in the two 
PFA Team of the Year in 74, 75, 75, 76 season. And it was in the 1975 season, in the March, that you had the call-in uh, from Don. And, and that was largely due to the press and due to Tony Waddington saying that Alan Hudson will play for a World Eleven before he plays for England the way he's going. Well, he did that. Um, I was in a couple of squads before that West Germany game, in which he could have picked me. Yeah. And um, um, one was I remember one was Yugoslavs. I didn't even get on the bench, and uh, I knew he wasn't going to pick me. And then all of a sudden, I thought to myself, "Hang on, we got Germany coming up in a few weeks' time. That could be the game he's going to pick me because he thinks I'm not going to be able to uh, cope with it." You know. And uh, me and Baldy spoke about this, and uh, he caught me and Baldy out once or twice when we weren't we wouldn't play bingo and carpet bowls <laughs> one 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 particular day. And we've been out along the uh, the street having a few drinks, and we weren't allowed to drink. And uh, he warned us about it. And uh, that was a, that was the game before the Germans. And he he made Alan Ball captain for the Germany game, and he picked me. And um, me and Bally looked at each other, and we smiled as much as to say, "This is our bit, you know, our chance." And I mean, Alan Ball already won the World Cup as a kid, you know, so he had much more experience than Don Revy about how to win you know, international matches and uh, it was just, it was just great and, and that photo of me and Baldy coming off the field would yep. be just about painted the picture, didn't it really? You know, it was, uh, it was, it was great. It, but yeah, the, the the reason I did get picked in the end was, was because of Tony banging the drum for me. I played a game at Tottenham, uh, Stoke beat them 2-0, I scored I played outstanding that game, and um, it was the first time Stoke had won there in a hundred years, and I'll, I'll never forget uh, all the, you know, the the Fleet Street gang were outside, and Tony was talking to them, and then I see that quote on the Monday uh, saying that, you know, that I, I played the, you know, how well have I actually got to play to get in the England team? It, uh, you know, I, I will play for the World Eleven before. You know, he was having a, he was having a knock it don uh, in the, in the nicest possible way because he wasn't the kind of man to point the finger at anyone. But he was just he, he was just stating a fact. What what the hell did I have to do to get a game? You know, because White Hart Lane was your favourite ground, wasn't it? Your dad used to take you there to watch uh, the t- the great Tottenham team, and also used to take you to Arsenal to watch the wonderful George Easton as well. Well, my, my, Chelsea's Pauls will hate me for saying this, but White Hart Lane was my favourite ground uh, outside of the Victoria ground when I played there for, the, for that period of time. But White Hart Lane uh, would always be outstanding. Yeah, my dad would take me there, me and my brother, because um, that was when they had the, the first the double, first ever double winning team. Uh, they, had, they had the best football team. Uh, we all have Jimmy Greaves, uh, John White played inside right. He always took me to see great inside forwards. Mm. Uh, the great Dave McKay. I mean, Blanche Flower. It was a, that was one, and and it was always packed out. And my dad would finish work. Uh, I mean, I, he worked for himself anyway. He was just a window cleaner, and he he got off work this day, and he said, "Come on, we'll go to Tottenham," and then. Whenever yeah. Arsenal were home on a Wednesday night, he would take us over to see George Eastham. And uh, and that was a story that, I mean, that really was an incredible story because, uh, you know, he didn't really used to say George Eastham the best player I've ever seen, but he used to say, watch this fella play, you know. And lo and behold, uh, there was George. I was standing next to George when he scored the winner against me in the final, in the 72 League Cup final with Stoke, which I got on my wall. I'm standing next to him as he's scoring it, and uh, and strangely enough, Tony C enough, I think, of me to think that I would be the one to replace him. And it was it was I remember my first game for Liverpool against Liverpool and, and pulling uh, George's shirt on and knew I had to do something to because he was such a hero in Stoke, uh, and I, I you know I couldn't rubbish his shirt kind of thing, and luckily enough it all worked out. 
Because one of your other heroes, the great Johnny Haynes, in 1950, Johnny would have been the first teenager to represent England at the World Cups. But in that squad of 22, England only took 17 and, and Johnny was one of those that was left. And to listen to the rest of this podcast, head on over to www.patreon.com forward slash SRB Media. Thank you. <laughs>